So now we will go into more detail. I will talk about central carbon metabolism, which is the uh, backbone of the catabolic site, catabolic unit. So here you see a more generic set of metabolic network. The, so the uh, dots correspond to metabolites, the lines correspond to reactions, and you see uh, that the central carbon metabolism is indeed a very small percentage of the whole metabolic reactions. But it is very, very important. There are smaller units, which we call pathways, that makes central carbon metabolism. We will talk about glycolysis, we will talk about pentose phosphate pathway, we will talk about tricarboxylic acid cycle, and we will talk about oxidative phosphorylation. So, let's start with glycolysis. The figure is from Prescott's Microbiology book. So, glucose is a substrate. It is outside the cell. You know, if it is uh, the most basic uh, nutrient for our cells. Once it is taken up by the cell, this is the generic route almost in all organisms, in microorganisms, in mammalians, in human. Uh, this is the most generic road, so, and it is called glycolysis. So glucose is taken up, and by a series of reactions, as you see here, it is converted to pyruvate. As you see here. And you see some of the reactions utilize ATP, and some of them produces ATP. We can group glycolysis into two stages. One is known as six carbon stage. The other one is known as three carbon stage. Why? This is the glucose, its chemical formula. So glucose is a molecule which includes six carbon atom, 12 hydrogen atom, and six oxygen atom. So focus on the, the number of carbons. We have six carbons. And the first three reactions here leads to, again, six carbon molecules. So the number of carbons in those new metabolites, new molecules, do not change. They have the same number of carbon. So that's why this stage is known as six carbon stage. And this is a very generic information you should know. The first reaction which converts glucose to glucose six phosphate requires ATP. ATP is the generic form of energy, so energy is required to convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And then the third step also requires ATP. So, two ATPs are required for the initial 6-carbon stage of glucose. Then what happens? We have this fructose 1,6-biphosphate here. Through an enzymatic reaction, it is broken down into two different metabolites. One is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and the other one is dehydroxyacetone phosphate. And both have three carbons. So initially fructose 1,6-biphosphate, it had six carbon. It is broken down into two metabolites. Each of those metabolites has three carbons. 
And from this on, there is again a set of enzymatic reactions. At the end, we have pyruvate. And all the metabolites here, they have three carbons. So that's why the second part of glycolysis is called, also referred as three carbon stage. And this is the formula for pyruvate. So it is, has three carbons. So focus on those two metabolites again. Two different metabolites are formed from fructose one six biphosphate, but this metabolite can be converted to the other formed three car carbon metabolite through a reaction. So ideally, it's like from one fructose, uh, one uh, unit of fructose one six biphosphate, two glyceraldehyde three phosphates are formed. If all the dihydroxyacetone formed is converted to glyceraldehyde three phosphate, there will be two units of glyceraldehyde three phosphate formed from one unit of fructose one six biphosphate. So from one glucose, we will have two maximum two units of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. And at the end, since these are all three carbon. Uh, metabolites, from one unit of glucose, you will have a maximum of two units of pyruvate. This is important. Remember, glucose is the, the most basic nutrient. So the cell needs to produce those metabolites. So from one unit of substrate, the cell can produce maximum two units of pyruvate. We said that ATP, NADH, etc. these are important. And let's see what is the net ATP and NADH and NADPH also production through the glycolysis pathway. So two ATPs were already consumed from one glucose, right? So minus two ATP. And in the second stage, this three carbon stage, we see that there is formation of two ATPs. But these two ATPs are from one three carbon molecule. So from one glyceraldehyde to one pyruvate, two ATPs are formed two ATPs are produced. If you want to define this in terms of glucose, from one glucose, we have two glyceraldehyde three phosphate, right? So this means that from two glyceraldehyde three phosphate, we will have four ATPs. From one glyceraldehyde three phosphate, we had two ATPs, which means from two glyceraldehyde three phosphate, we will have four ATPs. So in the three carbon stage, from one glucose, the cell can produce four ATP. The question was, what is the net ATP production within the glycolysis? So two ATP molecules are consumed here, four ATP molecules are produced here. This means that ATP gain is two. ATP is energy, remember, so that's why it is very important. This means that when the cell gets glucose and converts it into pyruvate, it can produce two units of ATP. So these energy, this energy is very important. The cell can use this energy for other 
uh, in the other processes within the cell. Cell needs to produce energy to survive. So uh, it can already produce two net ATPs through glycolysis. The other question, what is the net NADH gain? No NADH in the six carbon road. And here I have one NADH produced through this reaction. Uh, and that's it. So from one glycerol dietary phosphate, one NADH is produced, which means that from one glucose, there will be two glycerol dietary, 3-phosphate, from 2-glycerida, 3-phosphate, you will have 2-NADH. So net NADH gain from 1 unit of glucose is 2, unit of, two units of NADH. In summary, in the glycolysis pathway, we will have 2 net ATPs and 2 net NADHs. Glycolysis pathway is especially very, very important in cancer cells. So cancer cells uh, produce their energy, you know, they need energy to uh, proliferate and to survive. They drive their energy mostly from glycolysis. There are many other pathways in the cell that can help, uh, especially TCA cycle, we will talk about it, which can help uh, enormous amount of ATP or energy production. But uh, cancer cells, they drive their energy from glycolysis. And this phenomena is known as Warburg effect uh, in the literature. I also would want to remind you that our goal within this course is to simulate the cell by using metabolic networks. And the key in working with metabolic networks is to represent all those pathways as a list of reactions. So you need to write all the reactions associated with the metabolic pathways. And in this case for glycolysis, if I write those reactions, these are my reactions from glucose to pyruvate. First, we have this six carbon stage where fructose biphosphate is produced and two ATPs are consumed. And then fructose biphosphate is broken down into two three carbon stage. So these are the reactions for this three carbon stage. And here we have one ATP production, one ATP production, one NADH production. So the total number of reactions from glucose to pyruvate is 10. There are 10 reactions involved in, 10 major reactions involved in glycolysis pathway. And remember, I said that the reactions are catalyzed by enzymes. And the enzymes are proteins. So each protein is controlled by a gene. Here you see the gene names. So uh, PGI1 gene is responsible for this reaction, for example. These are the gene names from Saccharomyces cerevisia. So the gene names can be slightly different for other organisms. And for some reactions, there are multiple uh, genes that control the expression of the corresponding protein, corresponding enzyme. So uh, it's very important to come up with a list of reactions to simulate the cell metabolism by using metabolic networks. That was the take home message here. Just 
I want to show you also uh, a more zoomed version of those reactions. Let's take off the let's take the first reaction for example, the conversion of glucose to glucose six phosphate. So I told you that glucose is a six carbon molecule, and glucose six phosphate two a six carbon molecule, uh, and there is ATP to ADP conversion in this reaction. So ATP consumption means there is a so ATP is a, a, uni, a, a chemical, a molecule, which includes three phosphate units. Adenosine three phosphate, that's the name. So ATP consumption means one phosphate molecule is uh, separated from ATP and now it is ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So there are two in this ADP molecule and that uh, other phosphate molecule is now incorporated into glucose 6 phosphate. And this is the chemical structure version of the same uh, reaction. This is the glucose molecule. It has a cyclic structure. And this is the glucose 6 phosphate molecule. So, as you see, now the phosphate molecule from ATP is attached here. And we have ADP here. If you are wondering the chemical structure of ATP, here, so this is the structure of ATP. You see it has three phosphate units attached to an adenosine uh, molecule. So, remember our goal was to talk about central carbon metabolism. I said that there are different subunits in this central carbon metabolism. The first one is glycolysis because it uses the glucose taken up from the outside environment by the cell and it makes pyruvate. So, we already talked about glycolysis. Now, I will talk about pentose phosphate pathway, the other very important pathway within the central carbon metabolism. Why is this pathway called pentose phosphate pathway? I will also talk about this. Here, this part is the glycolysis. Remember, the six carbon stage and then two carbon stage and it goes till pyruvate. This glucose 6 phosphate here can be converted to fructose 6 phosphate, and this is glycolysis, or it can also be converted to another molecule called 6 phosphogluconate. And there is a set of reactions here again, and some, and at the end of those reactions, again, fructose 6 phosphate and glyceraldehyde 6 phosphate. Uh, are formed. So this is like a cyclic structure in a way. So glucose 6-phosphate is converted to some metabolites and they go back to fructose 6-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So this part is known as pentose phosphate pathway. Why? Pentose means 5. Penta means 5, as you all know. Uh, remember, our glucose and glucose 6-phosphate had three carbons. So with this reaction, we have 6-phosphogluconate, and the next reaction separates a, a carbon, carbon dioxide, from the substrate molecule and makes ribulose 5-phosphate. So a chemical, a molecule with 5-carbon is formed in this pathway. Originally we had six carbon molecules, now we have five carbon molecules. Glucose 5 phosphate and ribose 5 phosphate and xylose 5 phosphate, they all have five carbons. Because of those, the, the deformation of five carbon structures, this pathway is called pentose phosphate pathway. And all those molecules, because glucose 6 phosphate has phosphate, all those molecules have phosphates, as you know, as you see.
just one thing by the way I didn't uh, emphasize all those glycolysis reactions are cytosolic which means they the, the, the related enzymes are in the cytoplasm of the cell and those reactions take place in the cytoplasm in the cell the same with pantose phosphate pathway 2 so pantose phosphate pathway is also cytosolic uh, the related enzymes are located in the cytoplasm of the cell and that's how uh, all those metabolites are formed and that's where all those metabolites are formed in the cytoplasm of the cell. Let's ask the same question. What is the uh, benefit of this pathway for the cell? As you see, there is no ATP production in pentose phosphate pathway and no NADH production either. Instead, we see that there is one NADPH molecule formed here, one NADPH molecule formed in the second reaction of pantose phosphate pathway. So in terms of ATP, NADH, and NADPH, we have two net NADPH production here from glucose, assuming that all glucose 6 phosphate goes here so that's not reality some of them goes through the glycolysis some of them goes through pantose phosphate pathway but the maximum amount of NADPH the cell can produce from glucose is if glucose 6 phosphate all glucose 6 phosphate formed is diverted to pantose phosphate pathway and in this case the cell will produce two units of NADPH from one unit of glucose And remember, in the glycolytic pathway, we had ATP and NADH production. There wasn't any NADPH production. And this figure is again from Metabolic Engineering Principles book, by the way. And remember, if you want to perform simulations based on metabolic networks, we need to list the reactions. And here you see the list of reactions from pantose phosphate pathway, you see two NADPH production, a carbon dioxide release which needs which which leads to the formation of five carbon molecules, five carbon metabolites, and at the end, uh, the reactions produce glyceraldehyde phosphate and fructose six phosphate, which are the metabolites in the glycolysis pathway and you see associated genes from yeast Saccharomyces cerevisia here. Let's go on. We talked about glycolysis and pantose phosphate pathway, which are the uh, pathways within central carbon metabolism. The third very important pathway within central carbon metabolism is known as TCA cycle or Krebs cycle. So TCA means 3-carboxylic acid cycle. And uh, as opposed to the previous two pathways, which were cytosolic, this pathway is mitochondrial, which means that the related enzymes are located within mitochondria within the cell and uh, the reactions take place in mitochondria. Again, a figure from microbiology book by Prescott. So it starts with pyruvate. Remember the end product of glucose, glycolysis, sorry, was pyruvate. So first, in the TCA cycle, first the pyruvate is converted to a two carbon molecule. Remember pyruvate had three carbons. So in this reaction there is a carbon dioxide release which means there will be two carbons left in the pyruvate molecule and this molecule is called acetyl coenzyme A. And there is also NADH production within this step. That's nice. 
And in the TCA cycle, what happens is this acetylcoenzyme A is combined with a four carbon molecule to make citrate. So this is usually considered as this initiation reaction within the TCA cycle. So two carbons of acetyl CoA coming from pyruvate is combined with another metabolite called acetate, which has four carbons. And at the end, we have citrate molecule, which has six carbons. Then citrate is converted to cis-acotinate and isocitrate. These are all six carbon molecules too. And there is also an NADH production here. There was one here. Then there is also a carbon dioxide release in this last reaction, which means we now have five carbons, five carbon molecules, which is alpha ketoglutarate, which is converted to succinyl coenzyme A, Again, you have an NADH production here and another carbon dioxide release, which means now we have four carbon molecules. So, succinyl CoA is a four carbon molecule converted to succinate, fumarate, malate, and oxaloacetate again. So, this is a cycle, as you see. It starts with oxaloacetate and acetyl coenzyme A, and at the end, there is a cycle of reactions and again oxaloacetate is produced. And TCA cycle includes three subunits, four carbon stage, five carbon stage, and four, uh, six, four, five and four carbon stages. Now let's look at the TCA cycle in terms of the benefit to the cell in terms of ATP, NADH, and NADPH production. So we see one NADH here, we see one NADH here, one NADH here, one FADH2 here, a, uh, a similar molecule, and one NADH here. So from one pyruvate, we have four NADH and one FADH2. And what else? Here we have GTP. GTP is also an energy molecule. Uh, here, yeah. There's also one energy molecule, an ATP-like molecule, produced from pyruvate. So one GTP, one FADH2, four NADH, is they are produced from one pyruvate molecule within TCA cycle in the mitochondria of the cell. And here the, you see the reaction list representation of uh, TCA cycle. It is also referred as citric acid cycle, by the way. It starts with citrate or citric acid. Again, you see NADH formations, FADH formation, ATP or GTP formation. Uh, so this is the reaction list representation. Now, the fourth and the last important pathway in central carbon metabolism, which is known as oxidative phosphorylation. Again, a figure from Microbiology Book of uh, Prescott. Uh, let me summarize you. This, uh, first, let me introduce you uh, a very important phenomena. Remember, two net NADHs are produced within the T glycolysis and from one glucose, and four NADHs and one FADH2 are produced from one pyruvate within the TCA cycle. In oxidative phosphorylation, 
if there is oxygen available, NADH molecules already produced by the cell can be converted to ATP. And this is very, very important. Remember, ATP is the source of energy. The cell would want to maximize its ATP pool, right? It needs, it would want to have as much ATP as possible. Uh, because these energy molecules, then, I mean, they will be used for other processes uh, later. So, the NADH produced within glycolysis and within TCA cycle, is converted to ATP in this last pathway called oxidative phosphorylation. Let me repeat, oxidative phosphorylation is the pathway where the NADH and FADH2 molecules already produced within glycolysis and TCA cycle are converted to ATP energy molecules if oxygen is available. And the related enzymes, which makes this possible, the conversion of NADH to ATP, the related enzymes are uh, located within mitochondrial membrane. So this is the mitochondrial membrane, as you see. And these are the enzymes. You see four enzymes here. Uh, so four different enzymes work together to convert one NADH molecule uh, to three ATP molecules. So from one NADH molecule, within this oxidative phosphorylation step, three ATP molecules are produced. And this system, set of enzymes, are known as uh, ETC system, electron transport system. And these enzymes are called complex one, complex two, etc. And the last enzyme is uh, ATP synthase enzyme. Uh, these coefficients uh, change from organism to organism, but uh, these are from Saccharomyces cerevis, I think. But in the oxidative phosphorylation, the generic uh, uh, conversion rate between NADH and uh, ATP is from one NADH, three ATP is produced, and from one FADH, two ATP molecules are produced. So now we can calculate ATP yield from one glucose molecule during aerobic oxidation, oxygen availability, uh, for the cells. Again, a table from microbiology book, a very nice table. So, in the glycolytic pathway, remember, we had two net ATP production. And we had two NADH, net NADH production from one glucose. If three ATPs can be made from one NADH, then six ATPs will be made from two NADHs. So if all the NADHs produced within the glycolysis uh, are converted to ATP within oxidative phosphorylation, indeed we will have eight ATPs from one glucose through the glycolytic pathway. And we had this initial reaction towards three carboxylic acid cycle. Uh, remember this one. So from one pyruvate to one acetylcoenzyme A, we had uh, one NADH production. This is separately placed here. So from one pyruvate, we have one NADH. From one glucose, we have two pyruvates, which means from one glucose, we have two NADHs. 
again in oxidative phosphorylation from one ADH we have three ATPs if we multiply this by three we will have six ATPs at the end and if we look at the cycle reactions remember again we want to calculate the yield from one unit of glucose so in the TCA cycle from one pyruvate we have one GTP which is an ATP equivalent uh, molecule as I said so which means from one glucose we have two ATPs and from TCA cycle we had four NADH one was already accounted here so within the cycle part we have three NADH from one pyruvate we have six NADH from two pyruvates and if we have three NADH from one glucose sorry one pyruvate we have six NADH from two glucose again through the oxidative phosphorylation if we multiply this by three we will have 18 ATPs the yield for FADH was two we had a single FADH produced in the TCA cycle from one pyruvate which means two FADH2 from two glucose uh, one glucose sorry and if we multiply it by two we will have four ATPs from the FADH molecules and if we sum up all those ATPs we will see that the cell has the capacity to produce 38 ATP molecules at maximum from one unit of glucose in aerobic conditions this is an amazing potential right to, to uh, synthesize ATP from only one single glucose molecule uh, but this is only if there is oxygen there what if there is no oxygen if there is no oxygen then since the cell is trying to balance the use of its metabolites we will talk about this in the coming weeks in this in fact this is the uh, one of the most basic principles behind the simulation of metabolic networks so uh, the cell since in the TCA cycle you know there is lots of NADH production and FADH production and these can only be turned into ATP if there is oxygen if there is no oxygen the cell doesn't produce unnecessary NADH okay so there, the cell you know if it produces all those NADH and FADH and GTPs in the TCA cycle these NADH and FADH they will not be converted to ATP because there is no oxygen it's anaerobic conditions so rather than directing pyruvate to TCA cycle in anaerobic conditions the cell produces other metabolites from pyruvate and in mammalians this is usually lactate and in uh, microorganisms this is usually uh, other metabolites such as ethanol so this is an alternative road to TCA cycle if the, there is no oxygen availability if it is anaerobic and one very very important uh, benefit of this anaerobic pathways is that remember if there is no oxidative phosphorylation and if there is no oxygen NADH will not be converted to uh, ATPs and remember I said that 
the balancing is very, very important for the cell. So normally those NADH were converted to ATPs, so all the NADH were balanced within the cell in aerobic conditions. But in anaerobic conditions, okay, TCA cycle is not active, so we don't have any excess NADH or FADH because of TCA cycle. But glycolysis is the uh, the standard pathway to consume glucose, and within the glycolysis, we have those NADH productions, right? From one glucose, we have two NADHs. So how will the cell balance those NADHs? Okay, let me shortly repeat. Within TCA cycle, there are those NADH molecules, so cell inactivates TCA cycle in anaerobic conditions, so it doesn't have those unnecessary NADHs. But the glucose glycolysis pathway will already be active both in aerobic or in anaerobic conditions. Even there is no oxygen, there will be this glycolysis pathway, which means that we will have excess NADH here. What will happen to those NADH? How will the cell balance those excess NADHs? These alternative pathways indeed are also uh, helpful for these, this NADH balance because these reactions consume NADH. See, pyruvate is converted to lactate, and this conversion requires an ADH. So, in a way, cell activates those pathways in anaerobic conditions to balance its excess NADH in the cytosol through glycolysis reaction. So, by inactivating TCA cycle and by activating these pathways, conversion of pyruvate to lactate or ethanol. This reaction also, ethanol formation is also a uh, pathway which consumes NADH. So the excess NADH formed in glycolysis is cleared out thanks to those pathways in anaerobic conditions. Here you see a list of reactions that represent those anaerobic fermentative pathways, formation of acetaldehyde, ethanol, you see NADH, uh, and acetate. Uh, these are again from yeast. In mammalians, we have also lactate production. 